On today's Apple Daily, new release candidates drop. The numbers are looking good for Apple's earnings call and taking a closer look at the Mac Cube concept. For the latest Apple news, rumors and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. I'm iCave Dave and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. And if you do ring the bell, make sure that you post up hashtag notification squad down in the comments so that I can give you a shout out at the end of the next video, just like the guys at the end of this one. And I want to do a bit of a push on our social media. So if you want to head down to the comment section, you will find there are links to everything. So you can go to icavedave.com forward slash Facebook, Instagram, Discord, YouTube to get back to this channel. All of those things will work super easily and it seems to be the easiest way to get people back to uh, the different channels. So if you are on Instagram, I would love to see what you're doing over there. Bored now? Thanks, Ted. So let's get into the news. New release candidates drop for Apple's platforms. Release candidates have been posted for Apple's software platforms, including macOS 11.2, iOS and iPadOS 14.4, and more. This generally means we should be looking at a public release next week, most likely on Tuesday, assuming there are no major issues found with these. macOS 11.2 should hopefully fix the Bluetooth issues with peripherals. I am so hoping for this along with a couple of other issues like photos not saving pro raw changes properly, iCloud Drive randomly disabling itself out of spite when you don't sync your desktop and documents folders, and also system preferences refusing to unlock even with your password. The iPhone and iPad releases bring U1 integration for handoff for the HomePod Mini along with haptic effects, new guided Apple Fitness Plus workouts which can be used as walking workouts with your Apple Watch, Bluetooth audio devices having more detailed types to help with the level monitoring so that you can decide whether it's a car stereo or a pair of headphones or in-ear headphones, and some more stuff too. One more controversial move though is adding warnings if non-Apple camera modules have been installed after a repair, though this doesn't appear to disable any features. The numbers are looking good. Apple investors have raised their price targets ahead of the earnings call coming up at the end of this month, as it looks like Apple could well have their first $100 billion quarter after the launch of the iPhone 12, which for the first time all falls in that quarter after the delays to the launch. Apple One is also bolstering services revenue and Apple Silicon Macs, which have been a massive hit so far, all falling within that quarter. We'll be live streaming here on YouTube right after the call, so make sure you look out for the event coming up in your feeds and you can join me to break down what has been reported. But onto the main event, taking a closer look at the Mac Cube concept. After Bloomberg broke news that Apple is working on two new Mac Pro models, one possibly the last Intel anything using the current chassis, and far more interestingly, a smaller, less than half the size Apple Silicon powered one. So I reached out to my friend and talented Blender Cowboy, Apple Tomorrow on Twitter, to work on what the smaller, more interesting one could look like. There's been a lot of talk about the system evoking the nostalgia of the Power Mac G4 Cube, so that's kind of the volume target we're looking at. The G4 Cube is about the size of four to five current Mac Minis stacked up, but suspended in a Perspex frame so it looks like it's floating above your desk. It was also pretty much silent running, at least it would be if you threw in an SSD. These used to have no fans, but they also had the clicky old hard drives. It did come out in the early 2000s though. So I see the Mac Cube being purchased as a frame that gives you the option to replace a couple of the internal components going forward. So in essence, you're buying a cooling frame with the IO and the latest versions of Apple's pro level SOCs that are probably in a slot from the back that can be easily replaced by the end user. Maybe as easily as plugging in a game cartridge into an early 90s console like a Sega or a Nintendo and adding graphics, afterburner cards, storage arrays, and even replacing the main SOC in the system could be done in the same way. So let's be honest, once you get to having quiet fans that can move loads of air, there's not really much more that the frame itself needs to do as long as it can communicate with the outside world. The individual cards could have cooling channels cut through them so that they allow the best possible airflow as well as having their own heat sinks. And I think it'd be interesting to see how Apple addresses the upgradability going forward. The main SOC card would have everything that a current M1 SOC Mac has, um, but probably just more better. Probably a 16 to 20 core CPU with 12 to 16 of those being high performance Firestorm cores and four efficiency cores. Now those would be retained because normal computing doesn't need to fire up those quicker cores, meaning that less heat is already in the idling system, allowing the high performance cores to go for longer before the fans need to spin up when you do decide to push the system. 
keeping that base heat down is key. In terms of discrete graphics, I think it's going to be Apple all the way. I don't expect to see any NVIDIA or AMD support here, but I kind of see that as a good thing as I think the Apple graphics will smoke these pretty soon. Apple is working on up to a 128 core graphics, but general OS browsing would still be pretty much taken care of by the main SoC's integrated graphics, with just the major crunching being off-boarded to the discrete graphics for gaming, video processing, and on big heavy tasks and heavy workloads. That means that your interface and everything would stay just as snappy because you've got the fabric between the SoC on the compute and graphics side, but then when you really need the horsepower, you can offload it and the latency won't be such an issue. Of course, you'll still have IO for adding storage externally, but I think Apple will offer super fast internal storage options on these cartridge cards too, possibly, with multiple M.2 style ports where you can swap these out on a cartridge. The system would also probably have a system where it can automatically be configured into a RAID style system, making it super simple for users, but still keeping the speeds. I could see a base version of this having a way lower price point as well than the current Mac Pros, possibly $2,500 to $3,000 with an SoC card, and then you can upgrade from there, adding discrete graphics, additional storage, and more as you need it for your particular use case. So what do you think? Let me know down in the comments. Would you be up for a Mac Cube? And thank you again to Apple tomorrow on Twitter. Go and give them a follow for the awesome renders in this video. Okay, new members for the notification squad. We have Rene Pouliot. I think we already had him in there, but don't quote me on that. Adil Mohammed, Alec Iveki. And if I've missed anyone, let me know down in the comments and I'll make sure you get your shout out in the next video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.